welcome everybody to this presentation on pain assessment and treatment in palliative care. And thank you, Val, for uh, the introduction. Um, I'll uh, get going in the interest of time. So in terms of the agenda, we'll go through the objectives. Uh, we'll look at home and community care uh, by the numbers. Uh, I'll likely just kind of go through those slides and people can view them as part of the recording. Uh, we'll look at palliative care expertise for healthcare professionals related to pain, opioid side effects. We'll look at a case study and um, the references and more information will be at the end. So in terms of the objectives, I'm hoping by the end of this presentation that uh, people will have learned about the uh, pain, its definition, types of pain, uh, how to assess pain. I also help, hope that you'll gain knowledge about pain medications in the context of specific palliative pain situations, as well as learning how to identify a patient experiencing opioid toxicity and what to do about it. Uh, in terms of home care, uh, there these slides are just kind of going over some of the home care information around what's going on in the province, and I'll allow you guys to kind of review those uh, through the recording. I'll just slowly go through them. Okay, so in, in terms of uh, palliative care for healthcare professionals, uh, the Regional Palliative Consultation Team, as you guys know, provides uh, consultation services to healthcare professionals. Uh, we're a partnership between Home Care as well as Briere, uh, which is now, I guess, St. Vincent's Continuing Care. And uh, we are an interprofessional team of consultants who are made up of palliative care experts that include nurse practitioners, advanced practice nurses, as well as uh, physicians on the team. So you may see us in your retirement homes. Uh, we absolutely value your um, assessments and expertise. And uh, when we're involved in the care of a patient, please feel free to reach out to our services uh, for support. We are available 24 hours a day. In addition, if you have palliative care patients uh, or patients who are receiving a palliative approach to care and you need advice uh, related to medications and you're, you can reach out to us as well. Okay, so moving on to uh, pain. So I'll, I'll just start off by uh, looking at the kind of definitions, uh, types of assessments, management principles, treatments, and medication types. So in terms of the definition of pain, the definition as per the International Association of Pain is an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with or resembling that associated with actual or potential uh, nerve damage. There, <clears throat> it's always a personal experience. Uh, pain and nociception are two very different uh, phenomena. And uh, nociception is the sense that your system processes for uh, encoding the stimuli of pain. It's the physiological or uh, response underlying the sensation. Pain is an ache or bodily suffering or instance thereof, and it results from a uh, change in the function, disease, or injury by the body. So nociception is your processing of the information, and pain is the actual physical um, ache or bodily suffering that you're experiencing. Individuals learn the concept of pain through their life experience. So your life experience does impact your pain perception. A person's report of their experience of pain should be respected. So if a patient's telling you they're in pain, then that should be respected. And pain usually serves an adaptive role, but in the context of pain that's not necessarily related to a physical response would be uh, more like chronic pain, which is something that I'm not going to be talking about today. But in those situations, it doesn't serve an uh, adaptive role. Uh, an inability to communicate pain does not negate the possibility that a patient is experiencing pain or that pain is present. So in terms of the different types of pain, uh, we I mentioned it briefly on the, the last slide. So nociceptive is related to tissue damage. So that tissue damage could be pain that's due to a tumor invading a cell wall or ch the chest wall, for example. Uh, so that's tissue damage. Neuropathic pain is pain that's related to the nervous system or damage to the nervous system. So uh, it could be from, for example, high blood, blood sugar levels, 
It could be related to inflammation, et cetera. Other uh, types of pain includes include neurological dysfunction. So for example, like fibromyalgia. So we'll get into uh, kind of a detailed table looking at the different types of pain. So in terms of nociceptive pain, there can be somatic, visceral, or colicky type nociceptive pain. So somatic nociceptive pain could be related to bone metastases or a fracture. A visceral pain would be more like those organ type experiences, so uh, maybe related to liver metastases. And colicky type pain is that pain that's kind of like crampy in nature and uh, may be related to, say, something like a malignant bowel obstruction. In terms of neuropathic pain, uh, it can be related to nerve damage or it could be potentially related to like a, a post stroke, for example, so central uh, neuropathic pain. And then, of course, there are uh, mixed type pain. So a patient may be experiencing both uh, nociceptive and neuropathic pain. In terms of how we identify nociceptive versus neuropathic, uh, the way people describe their pain can be extremely helpful. So for example, you may hear in nociceptive pain, things like aching, throbbing, sharp, cramping. In terms of neuropathic, you may hear electric, tingling, burning. So when uh, we'll, we'll get to the pain assessment piece, um, you'll hopefully under, hopefully see that when you ask people to describe their pain, you can gain uh, quite a bit of uh, detailed information from that. Uh, in terms of pain assessments, um, that's what we'll move on to next. So in terms of the pain assessment, this information is taken from the pain management best practice guideline from the uh, Registered Nursing Association of Ontario. And it can be a really helpful guide uh, when we're trying to get more detailed information about a uh, person's pain. So this is the OPQRS TUV uh, is the acronym. So O would stand for onset. When did it begin? How long does it last? How often does it occur? P would be for provoking or palliating, and palliating meaning what makes it better. So provoking is what makes it worse, and palliating would be what makes it better. In terms of quality, this is where we get into the descriptor. So what does it feel like? Can you describe it? In terms of R, that would be region or radiation. Where is it located? Does it move? Does it stay in that one location? So region or radiation. S would be severity. So this is where you're going to use that uh, verbal analog scale. So that zero being no pain and 10 being the worst possible pain. It can be helpful when you're assessing severity to assess what the pain is right now. What is it at its best? What is it at its worst? And what is it on average? In terms of T, that would be timing and treatment. For example, is the pain constant? Does it come and go? Is there a particular time that it is worse? When medications and treatments are currently being used, and I think fortunately in a retirement home, you all already know those types of treatments because they would need to be ordered in order to be administering them. I think the challenge would be if you're working, uh, say you're administering medications or you're supporting care of a patient who is administering their own medications, uh, I would really encourage you uh, to have the patient provide you with the bottle of medication that they're using or their blister pack to get a clear idea about what they're taking because sometimes patients themselves don't know exactly what they're taking or they may misinterpret what was ordered. So if you are uh, investigating a patient's treatment who is not somebody that uh, you are administering the medications and have a clear record of their medications, it can be quite helpful to get um, to review their bottles or their blister packs. You'll wanna know how effective the treatments are. You'll want to identify if there's any side effects uh, from the medications and or treatments. In terms of you, uh, that would be what's the patient's understanding and what's the impact on them. So things asking things like, what do you believe is causing your pain? Are there any other symptoms with this pain? How is this pain impacting you and or your family? 
And then uh, values would be the V. So in terms of values would be like, what's their goal for pain management? This can be really helpful in particular if a patient um, has, say, a metastatic pain from a cancer and they tell you that they want to have zero pain, the likelihood of us being able to get a person's pain to zero um, is, is not high. You know, we will absolutely do our best, but sometimes there will be a certain level of pain uh, that people will be experiencing. And sometimes it's about learning how to get that pain so that they can be functionally active. Um, understanding the goal for the patient, what's their pain goal in terms of their comfort goal? Are they wanting to have their pain managed so they can, you know, continue going out for walks? Are they wanting to have their pain managed so that they can manage their care within their apartment? Um, and then just giving them an opportunity to uh, speak about uh, what their experience with pain is. In terms of assessing the the pain somebody's experiencing, it can be very challenging if they're nonverbal or if they um, have a cognitive impairment. And so there are tools that you can use to help with those assessments. And we'll review a couple of them now. So one of them is the pain assessment in advanced dementia, which is the pain ad scale. So you can see it's pretty self-explanatory uh, on the document here. So uh, the scores range from zero to 10, similar to the verbal analog scale, and a higher score indicates more severe pain. So zero would be no pain and 10 would be severe pain. So you can use that scale for your patients who do have dementia or uh, cognitive impairment. Another one would be, and this is for people who want to do a more, uh, a, a, like a very, very um, thorough assessment in uh, seniors' pain. There is a pain assessment scale for seniors with severe dementia. So it's a 60 item checklist with four subscales. So this isn't something that you would necessarily be able to do um, on an individual basis, but something more that a retirement home could look into if they wanted to, um, say, have a pain champion and or um, like a, a really strong approach to pain management in patients with severe dementia. So it looks at things like facial expressions, activity and body movements, social personality and mood, as well as physiological indicators, uh, uh, including sleeping and eating. Um, so I'm not gonna go into detail um, in relation to this, uh, but it just something that I wanted to put out there in case uh, there were uh, retirement homes that wanted to uh, look at into that in more detail. So when do we need to assess pain? We should be assessing pain through daily and throughout the day. In particular, if you provided treatment, you do want to assess for the benefit of that treatment. So if you're providing by mouth medications, uh, a reassessment should occur uh, kind of within 30 to 60 minutes to assess the benefit of the medication that was provided. For subcutaneous medications, that reassessment can be within 15 to 30 minutes to ensure that uh, the patient did experience relief from their pain. In terms of principles related to uh, pain management, we want to look at the right dose of opioid being the one that achieves the best analgesic with the fewest side effects. So when we're treating uh, pain, we can look at things like by the ladder, by the mouth, by the clock, with breakthroughs. So by the ladder would be using the, the WHO uh, pain ladder, which we will uh, look at uh, later in the presentation by the mouth is like by oral administration. So ideally we're providing pain management medications orally. That is the most effective and generally preferred route. By the clock would be that for most patients who have continuous pain, a uh, regular regimen would be really important to manage the person's pain. So that's by the clock. With breakthroughs would include the addition of uh, breakthrough medication for patients who experience pain above and beyond the what the continuous dosing is supporting. 
So some people would call those rescue doses. Some people would call them PRN. For the individual is really ident like just being clear that there is no one thing that's going to fit every single person. So pain management does need to be individualized. We want to also treat all aspects of suffering. So we don't only want to treat the physical aspects of a person's suffering, but also the psychological, spiritual, and uh, social issues, as those can have quite a significant impact on the experience of somebody's pain. We want to monitor, treat, monitor treatment uh, efficacy regularly. Like we saw on the last slide, we want to follow up to make sure that the pain medications that we administer are effective. So we uh, if they're not effective, we want to adjust the doses as required to help control a person's pain. And in most cases, uh, increases will be required. And that in, in particular for uh, things like opioids, and that's uh, due to tolerance. So in our bodies, uh, when we have pain medications, they bind to receptors. When those receptors are blocked, our body does a miraculous thing. It says all of our receptors are blocked we obviously need to make more of them. So when our body makes more receptors, then a person can experience pain. And so that's tolerance. We become tolerant to the medication. The other thing that will likely happen is as a person's disease progresses, it's possible that they may have increased pain. So we do expect that there will be a need to increase uh, pain uh, medications throughout the course of a person's disease. We want to identify and treat the underlying cause. So if the underlying cause is a, a tumor, for example, and the patient could have chemotherapy or immunotherapy or radiation, and then we would want to, if the patient is willing, uh, provide those treatments to help uh, re reduce the pain that they're experiencing. If the patient's experiencing pain related to an infection, they should be on antibiotics to treat that infection. And that's where uh, as-needed dosing can be helpful because there may be an acute period of time that a person needs increased doses or more frequent doses, but their pain management would be well-managed with lower doses after the underlying cause is treated. So you may see that in some patients that have uh, really high levels of pain, say with a new diagnosis of uh, cancer, but as they're they have treatments, their pain is better controlled and dosing can be reduced. Uh, one thing I wanted to identify uh, and talk about just very briefly is uh, total pain. So pain that is multidimensional, including the physical, spiritual, social, and psych psychological aspects of pain. And that's really that bullet point of uh, treating all aspects of suffering. So if a person is struggling with their, um, if a person's struggling physically, um, but their, their pain is higher than you may expect, it may be related to psych psychological distress that they're experiencing and sometimes talking to them about those psychological distress, dis things that are causing them distress, like fear of dying, um, fear of leaving their families, whatever whatever the patient identifies to you, sometimes just listening to them can help uh, relieve their, their suffering. In terms of non-medication-based treatments for pain, I think they're important to highlight. Um, having the healthcare team explain what's happening sometimes can, can help. So how we think about pain can cause pain. So if a person is thinking very negatively uh, or they're you know, jumping to conclusions, it can be really helpful to have the healthcare team explain what's happening. Using imagery, using distraction, relaxation, music, uh, companionship. So sometimes having, if you have volunteers that can spend time with people who are alone or lonely, uh, exercise can be helpful, uh, positioning, using lotions and massages. So not to forget the non-pharmacological treatments that could be available. As I mentioned, we were gonna look at the WHO ladder. So on the foundation um, is the non-opioid and or adjuvants. So um, the next would be kind of your mild to moderate pain would be opioids to treat those. So step two, those would be like your tramadol, your codeines. 
And then step three would be for more moderate and severe pain, uh, which would include your hydromorphone, morphine, and fentanyl, methadone. And we'll go through some of those uh, in the upcoming slides. Um, one thing that you may see when palliative care gets involved is that we kind of skip step two um, and we go uh, straight up to step three. And that's because uh, Tylenol and it, it will, and I think we'll get into that later in the presentation as well. But you may notice uh, that's that we skip from step one all the way up to step three and we don't uh, use uh, codeine and tramadol as much as maybe um, other providers do. Um, and on the very, very base of the WHO pain ladder, you can consider things like um, palliative radiation or surgery as appropriate. Um, and looking at those psychological issues that may be impacting the pain as well. In terms of medication types, so types of medications that we use to treat pain include non-opioids, the adjuvants, and opioids. So non-opioids would include your acetaminophen, your NSAIDs, and, uh, for example, topical creams. Adjuvants could be things like steroids, uh, antidepressant medications, including tricyclic antidepressants, uh, SNRIs, and anticonvulsants. These maybe are not specifically for pain, but can help manage pain. Opioids, uh, again, we mentioned that step two would be more of like a weak opioid, like a tramadol or a codeine, and step three would be those stronger opioids like morphine, methadone, fentanyl, oxycodone, uh, buprenorphine, hydromorphone, and I have sufentanil here, but sufentanil is not something that you would ever see in the community. It's something that they administer in hospital or on the palliative care unit. So let's look at step one with the non-opioid medications in a little bit more detail. So uh, acetaminophen, we'll start off with that. You wanna use acetaminophen cautiously in patients who have liver failure. It's not that it can't be used, but uh, that it would should be used cautiously. Uh, daily maximum dosing of acetaminophen for a person who's well would be 4,000 milligrams. For frail or elderly patients would be 2,500 milligrams. And for patients with liver failure would be uh, 2,000 milligrams. Not that you guys are necessarily doing prescribing, but it can be helpful to have these kind of just kind of general ideas about what would be a uh, reasonable dosing. In particular for patients, say, who are getting straight dosing of acetaminophen and also PRN. You just want to be really cautious with how much you're providing. NSAIDs. So there's a lot of different non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, including ibuprofen, naproxen, ketorolac, diclofenac, indomethacin, salcoxib. So um, these medications can cause irritation to uh, the gastric mucosa, with, in particular with long-term use. So uh, patients who are on these long-term may need a proton pump inhibitor. There's two types of NSAIDs, uh, COX and COX-2 inhibitors, uh, ones more specific to the COX receptor. They do work to decrease inflammation. And when these are used, they should be used cautiously in patients with kidney and heart failure. If a person's kidneys are already damaged, NSAIDs may be an option since you're not going to be able to really do more harm. So really the key here would be uh, care goals or goals of care. But in the case of a person who already has kidney failure and they have the best pain control from an NSAID, it may be a reasonable option to use at, at lower doses. Um, NSAIDs are often available in topical creams. So that's like your Voltaren and uh, that. So when you're using Voltaren, you are using uh, an NSAID. Okay, so let's move on to opioids for mild to moderate pain. Weak opioids, uh, for example, tramadol. For tramadol, this is a medication that often many patients experience dizziness or vertigo with. A uh, typical starting dose might be 37.5 milligrams of BID or TID. Um, again, it's a medication that we don't um, in palliative care typically uh, use or recommend. We would typically um, move up to a stronger opioid at really uh, much lower doses. Codeine uh, is another mild opioid. It does have to be metabolized in your body to morphine before it can be active. The challenge with codeine is that there are uh, 
patients who have variable metabolism. So the majority of people will metabolize it totally normally and it works just fine, but there are some people who are hyper metabolizers. So you give them a, a low dose of codeine and it actually has a bigger impact than what the dose actually is. And then there's some people who do not metabolize it at all. So it cannot move into its active form and therefore their pain is not managed really at all. Typical starting doses would be 15 milligrams every four hours as needed. And it's often mixed with other medications like acetaminophen. Um, so Tylenol-3, for example, would be acetaminophen mixed with codeine. And interestingly, caffeine is in there too, in Tylenol-3s. So I won't spend a lot of time on those ones because they're not ones that we would uh, typically recommend for use from a, a palliative care perspective. In terms of... Uh, uh, opioids for moderate to severe pain. Uh, stronger opioids include morphine, hydromorphone, oxycodone, fentanyl, methadone, uh, buprenorphine, and as I mentioned, sufentanyl, but that would be in the palliative care unit or hospital. So in terms of opioid dosing, we talked about uh, straight dosing. So that's that baseline pain. So this would be regular dosing of pain medications to get that baseline pain control. And those pink uh, peaks and valleys would be a breakthrough pain. So a patient who's experiencing breakthrough pain. In terms of getting baseline pain uh, managed, you can do this by using regular dosing of short acting medications, or you can do this by using longer acting doses of medication. So next we'll look at different forms of uh, medications. So there are uh, from an opioid perspective, there are immediate release uh, options available. So there's tablets, there's elixirs, there's suppositories, and there are injectable uh, medications. So those would be medications that are immediate released. And then there are sustained release dosing of medications that would be in a patch form or in a content or extended release or delayed release uh, medication. So typically, uh, content medications would be given every 12 hours or every 24 hours. Patches uh, that are used include the buprenorphine patch, and which would, is, uh, I think, brand name is Butrans, and then uh, fentanyl. And those can be applied depending on the schedule. Some of them are every three days, some of them are, are once a week. So knowing what medication you're giving the patient is going to be important to understand uh, the effect that it's gonna have. So immediate release medications are taken in, they're released immediately, that, that full dose. Sustained release medications are taken in, but the dosing is released slowly over a 12 to 24 hour period, depending on the medication. So it is very important to know the medication. You wanna know what a typical dose would be. You wanna know how long you can expect it to last. And you wanna know, how it's taken, so by what route, how it's metabolized, and how it's excreted. So I have a question. What would be the shortest acting opioid? I don't know if anyone feels brave enough to come off their microphone and answer this question. And I realize we didn't cover it um, specifically, but just from your experience. Kelly, I don't know if you can see the chat, but um, I can't. the overwhelming majority are coming up with fentanyl. Oh, you guys are so smart. <laughs> well done. Yes, it is fentanyl. So one other thing that I think is important to point out would be the dose doesn't equal the strength. So if you're giving a lower dose of one medication to a patient, for example, one milligram, it doesn't mean that it's weaker than a higher dose of a different medication, for example, 2.5 milligrams. So if you're giving one milligram of hydromorphone and 2.5 milligrams of morphine, are those the same? So a patient getting one milligram is actually getting a higher dose 
than the patient who's getting 2.5 milligrams. So the patient getting one milligram of hydromorphone is getting a higher dose of opioid than the patient getting 2.5 milligrams of morphine. And that's because the different medications don't have the same impact on the body. So one milligram of hydromorphone is the equivalent of five milligrams of morphine. So uh, the other thing to consider would be a 25 microgram patch of fentanyl is the same as 100 milligrams of morphine in 24 hours. So I just want you guys to be aware. Sometimes people think that when they're giving uh, a lower number, it means that the dose is lower, but it really depends on the medication that you're giving. So just to, to keep that in mind. And that's important to you if medications are being switched from one type of medication to another, um, the dosing needs to be adjusted appropriately. In terms of routes of administration, so routes of administration can include orally, rectally, by injection, by patch on the skin. Uh, a dose typically changes based on the route. So for example, oral morphine or hydromorphone is about half as potent as subcutaneous or intramuscular. So a five milligram dose of oral medication would be equal to a 2.5 milligram dose of subcutaneous medication. So you wouldn't want to give the same oral dose subcutaneously. Fentanyl, interestingly, is the same in the patch form as it would be in the injectable form. In terms of how a medication is excreted, so uh, this can be important if you're working with patients who have uh, end organ failure. So typically medications are metabolized in the liver and the, the liver would form an active metabolite, which can then act on pain receptors and it's often excreted in the kidneys. So knowing your patient, say you're working with a patient who has kidney failure, you're gonna maybe have a different duration or different frequency of administration of a medication. So the duration of action, for example, of morphine or hydromorphone in a patient with renal failure, so if you have a normal renal function, would be about four hours. For a person with impaired renal function, it may be six hours. And for a person with severe renal impairment, it may be much longer. So it may be appropriate to administer regular dosing of short-acting medication like every 12 hours for a patient who has severe renal impairment, and they may have very good pain control with that. If you administered it on a regular schedule of like, say, for example, four hours, they may become quite toxic on that dose. So knowing uh, your patient's comorbid medical conditions can be really important, in particular, if you're using pain medications. In terms of opioid side effects, that's what we'll look at next. So we'll look at some common side effects. Does anybody want to take a, a, you know, what you think are some of the common side effects for opioid medications? Constipation? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Annie. Anyone else? Nausea and vomiting. Yep, very common, in particular when you're first starting medications or when you're increasing dosing. Anyone else? Anyone find uh, their confusion or yeah. sleepy? Sleepy, yeah, exactly. We hit some of the highlights for sure. So, in terms of the constipation, constipation is not proportional to the amount of opioid. And it will not get better with time. It requires ongoing prevention and treatment with laxatives. So when I say it's not proportional with the amount of opioid, so if you have one milligram of morphine versus five milligrams of morphine, it doesn't mean that you're going to have worse constipation at the higher dose of morphine. The fact that you're on morphine or hydromorphone or any opioid puts you at risk for constipation. And that's because the receptor, there's a receptor in our guts that gets blocked and it's the receptor that tells our guts to move. That gets blocked by the opioids. So it's a mu receptor. We have mu receptors in our, our guts just like we have in the rest of our body. And in the rest of our body, it helps minimize our experience of pain. But unfortunately in our guts, it means that we don't uh, move our bowels uh, very well. Uh, 
Nausea uh, typically resolves within 72 hours. And usually we would recommend uh, Maxran. Sorry. Um, usually we would recommend, recommend uh, Maxran or Demperidone uh, with initiation of an opioid uh, just for the first three days or starting at lower doses and increasing slowly to help manage nausea. And drowsiness, again, that will usually resolve within uh, 72 hours, um, but something certainly to prepare uh, patients about in particular related to if they're still driving or if they're still working, um, just to let them know that they may be drowsy. And once people are stabilized on their medication, oftentimes they can uh, continue with their uh, regular routine. The other thing uh, to consider, opioids can become toxic in a person's body. So we do want to regularly screen for uh, toxic levels of opioids in a person's body. And some of the signs that we might see uh, with that include myoclonus. Myoclonus is uh, where you have like muscle jerking and, and twitching. Hyperalgesia. So hyperalgesia would be where a person uh, experiences severe pain or is if experiencing pain uh, despite their pain medication. So they become hyperalgesic. Allodynia would be the experience of pain with normal touch. Um, so if you touch them gently on their skin, they may experience a severe pain. A person who is somnolent, uh, extremely agitated, or they have an uh, altered cognition. Those are all things that you should be screening regularly for and uh, letting the provider know that um, the patient may be becoming uh, opioid neurotoxic. Um, in terms of how uh, that's managed, we'll look at that on the next slide. So typically you can uh, reduce the opioid dose, though this would take a little bit longer for the person to recover from. Uh, doing a switch of the opioids, so we mentioned earlier, like moving from morphine, say, to hydromorphone or vice versa. And uh, hydration can help in some cases. If an opioid switch is uh, required for the patient, there are some dose calculations that would need to be um, completed and certainly uh, our team could help support that. In terms of cancer pain. Kelly, can I just interrupt yeah. for a sec before you move on to that idea? Somebody mentioned in the chat about a decreased respiratory rate with opioids. Do you wanna comment on that? Yeah, um, for sure. So opioids can absolutely uh, lead to a decrease in uh, respiratory response and certainly at um, levels that are um, toxic, they, um, sorry, my, from my phone ringing earlier, it was off the hook. Um, yeah, so uh, uh, altered respiratory response. That would be when a person is extremely toxic. So counting the respirations can be really important. So anything eight or less would be a sign of a uh, potential overdose. If your patient does have low uh, respiratory status and it, they're not at end of life, that could be a sign that they've, they've overdosed on the medication and they may require um, naloxone. So respiratory rate of eight or less. Um, typically, opioids can be used in patients not only for pain, but for dyspnea. And in the case of dyspnea, what, we're, what our goal would be is that the person doesn't experience shortness of breath in the same way. It's not that we would be using the medication with the goal of reducing the respiratory rate necessarily, but with the goal of making their breathing feel more comfortable for them. So if your patient does have a, a respiratory rate that is low, uh, like I say, below eight, that could be a sign of, of overdose as opposed to um, toxicity. So certainly, yes, that's a, that was a good point. Does that answer the question? I don't know. Yeah, the that's person... great. Thank you so much. Okay. And I, the person who asked it, is that? It wasn't really a question. It was something that they had identified as a side effect. So I oh yeah yeah I perfect okay perfect sorry I can't see the chat 
um, in terms of cancer pain. So we'll look at just kind of uh, specific types of pain. So uh, cancer pain in terms of uh, pain management and cancer pain, opioids are the mainstay of treatment. Um, and you may see, we, we've talked about the different types, so I won't read them here. Uh, in terms of patients with uh, metastatic sites uh, to bone or liver, uh, they may may benefit from radiation treatment or steroids as well as the opioids. And uh, with tumor involvement, tumors can invade nerves. And so it's not uncommon for people to have neuropathic type pain. So we may treat uh, get with GABA receptor medications like gabapentin, pregabalin, or methadone. So that would be uh, cancer pain. Pain, for example, from uh, malignant uh, bowel obstruction, so the goal of treatment in a malignant bowel obstruction would be to unblock the bowel. So for example, if a person had a complete bowel obstruction, uh, we would want them to have nothing by mouth. If they only have a partial obstruction, uh, then we would uh, still be able to uh, provide fluids, but it would be in, in small amounts because fluids can uh, bypass a, a partial obstruction. Typical medications you would see in a patient who has a bowel obstruction include dexamethasone. Uh, typically, the person would have eight milligrams to start off daily, morning, and uh, before two, and ideally would be around noon. This medication is geared towards decreasing inflammation. Uh, metoclopramide could be used in the, in the patient with a partial obstruction, and metoclopramide works by um, kind of tightening up the lower esophagus and stomach to allow contents from the stomach to move into the duodenum more quickly. It is not safe to use that in the case of a patient who has a complete obstruction. So if they're not passing gas, they're not passing stool, they have uh, nausea and vomiting and like projectile vomiting, you would not be using metoclopramide that if they have been on that medication previously should stop. And instead you would be using uh, Haldol to manage any nausea and vomiting. Another medication that you may see in the case of malignant bowel obstructions would be octreotide. So octreotide helps to minimize GI secretions because our guts are constantly producing fluid. Um, and so the octreotide would help to minimize those secretions so that they're not coming up against that blockage until we can kind of have it, have it resolved. Uh, next type of pain would be chest pain. So a person who's experiencing chest pain, do they have a cardiac history? Uh, if so, you would want to manage the cardiac condition. Do they have nitroglycerin? You would use that if it's ordered. Do they have opioids? Uh, those can help to relieve uh, chest pain. And I think in the case of chest pain, it's going to be really important that you understand what a person's goals of care are. So if a person's having chest pain and their goals and they have, you know, say, end-stage congestive heart failure, and they're uh, wanting comfort management only, their goals of care may be not to return to hospital. And if they have chest pain, they may want to have just pain management, even if they are having a heart attack and it might lead to the end of their life. So uh, chest pain in a person who is not comfortable with that uh, plan for their, their end of life would need to go uh, into hospital if it is cardiac in nature and investigations need to occur. In terms of central pain from a stroke, so sometimes uh, patients have a neuropathic uh, pain related to uh, central pain. Um, this would be treating with, again, GABA receptor medications like gabapentin and pregabalin. Patients post-stroke may have a difficult time with swallowing. So uh, potentially using liquid formulations um, or looking at a uh, feeding tube in patients who have uh, stroke and that's part of their goals of care. Typically, you guys obviously wouldn't be doing uh, feeding tubes um, in a retirement home, but if a person were to come back to the retirement home with a feeding tube, um, medications can be provided in liquid form through that feeding tube. If a person is close to end of life and they have central pain or um, previous chronic pain and are not able to tolerate oral uh, medications, you can consider opioids. 
um, though they're not typically recommended in uh, chronic pain or central pain for patients. But of course, near end of life, we do tend towards those uh, in order to provide comfort to a person at that phase of their life. Um, for patients who are experiencing uh, non-cancer pain, so this would be uh, potentially patients who are not um, necessarily palliative, or they are palliative, but they have uh, non-cancer pain that may be chronic in nature. You do want to optimize the non-opioid pharmacotherapy and non-pharmacologic therapy versus uh, trial of opioids. So using topical creams, your NSAIDs, your acetaminophen, uh, and non-opioid medication, um, eventually they may have trial of opioids. And in the case of a person who's experiencing, say, joint issues from osteoarthritis or osteoarthritic type pain, um, they may benefit most from having surgery. Though, interestingly, I was listening to a talk on chronic pain, and there are nerve blocks that can be used for patients who have severe joint pain, in particular in the knees, with really good benefit. So if they're uh, waiting, say, a knee replacement surgery, uh, you could potentially refer them to the chronic pain clinic for uh, injection. And it's around, uh, they, they provide them around some of the nerves in the lower knee area. And there's been some really good results with those. And so anyways, just thought I'd pass that along. It's not palliative in nature, but you guys likely see a lot of people who have uh, osteoarthritic type pain. So um, that's it for the main presentation, but I do have a case study that I wouldn't mind um, going over with you guys just briefly. So um, we have a patient, Suzanne, uh, she moved to retirement home two years ago. She has congestive heart failure and uh, COPD. And she has a new diagnosis of colon cancer with metastatic sites to her liver. You're assisting her with her morning care. You notice that she's holding her abdomen and wincing. What do you think might be going on? And maybe if you guys can read from the chat, if you see things in the chat. Yeah, I can, uh, I can share what's going on in the chat. There's nothing yet. Okay. Up there just in case. I think it would be really important just to do an initial assessment and find out about the pain first before mm -hmm. thinking about what exactly is going on. Okay. So what types of things would you guys want to know from Suzanne? Um, bowel function. I'm wondering if it is she able. To, what's going on with her colon cancer? Is she able? Is she still um, being able to use her bowels? Or is she constipated? Is is there diarrhea? Um, is there a colostomy? What's going on? Um, what medication she's on? Yeah. Um, if there's any narcotics, because maybe there's constipation related to that. Yep, exactly. So in terms of your assessment of her pain, what are some of the things that you guys would want to assess related to her pain? When did it start? What does it feel like? Um, does anything help? That kind of stuff. Yeah. If she's feeling pain, right? So you might see that she's holding her abdomen and notice that she's wincing, but is that for her, is that pain? You know, is it just how she, is that just how she moves? Is it pain? Is it in her abdomen even? You know, is she wincing because of pain in her knee? Uh, when did it start is a, is a great one. Where is it located? All of those PQ, RST, UV. Yeah, absolutely. So... Anything else that you can think of for Suzanne? So we talked about maybe it being bowels, maybe it being uh, her tumor. If I'm you guys- If she was recently diagnosed with her cancer, like how is she doing from an anxiety and emotional perspective as well? Yep. 
were they talking to her about her treatment options and she's not really certain about them and she's got a lot of questions and concerns you know is her family you know maybe she'll bring up all kinds of different things you know like I'm really worried about my kids and I don't really want to you know, move forward with treatment I've heard all of my treatment options but my kids are pressuring me and I'm feeling a lot of stress or absolutely Val um where's she at with this new diagnosis she's had this these other two diagnoses she's got heart failure she's got COPD already adding on colon cancer how does she feel about that yeah absolutely so you do identify that she does have pain and it is related to her her cancer in her abdomen and you call the physician at the retirement home and they provide you with this order. So they give you an order of morphine two to four milligrams by mouth or subcut every two to four hours as needed for pain or shortness of breath because she's got COPD and CHF and she's got this new pain. Any concerns about this order? Is she taking anything by mouth? Is my first question. I would say also that um, the dose is the same. Is the dose the same for PO and sub Q? Yeah, it is. Is that appropriate? No. No. So this is an order that you would want to go back to the physician and, and clarify, can I please have PO orders and separate subcut orders? But if the patient is still taking by mouth medications, we know that by mouth is the, is an ideal route mm -hmm. and there would be no reason to add subcutaneous dosing. If she is still taking by mouth mm -hmm. medications in particular, right. she's new in her diagnosis. We haven't even opioids haven't even started for this patient as yet. So it would it would not be appropriate to have PO and subcut uh, initially. So we'd expect just by mouth orders for this patient. Mm -hmm. And how, how not that I'm just throwing it out there. How easy it is is it to give uh, two to four milligrams of morphine? Right, morphine comes in five milligram, ten milligram tabs. Oh. So it's going to be really difficult to give that dosing unless they order like an elixir, if that's the dose that they want. But in, in tablet form, they can, it would be 2.5 or 5 milligrams. Sometimes pharmacies are not comfortable to cut them into quarter tabs and it's not ideal. So if you are working in those lower doses, it is a little bit better if it is um, oral liquid. Um, Kelly, an interesting question in the, in the chat. Um, there's lots of CCs that are not nurses. Um, and the, the question is, what kind of role can they play? And so I, my immediate response would be more of an assessment of pain. So to be able to report back to the director of care or, yeah. or yourself or the, the doctor on site, if, if that, or the nursing provider, that, hey, it's effective, not effective. This is the kind of pain they're having. This is what they're describing and that kind of thing. Um, I know that's a, I know that's a huge concern um, with my colleagues that are therapists or social workers, et cetera, that they, they're not familiar with what is normal orders, what's not ab what's abnormal orders, Perfect. that kind of yeah. thing. Um, I know for myself as an RN, if I get a bunch of medication orders, I can say, oh, wow, that's, you know, there, there's repetition, there's too much, there's, it doesn't, doesn't make sense, you know, but if I'm not, if you're not an RN, that you, you run into the problem of not knowing if it's correct or not, and trusting your nursing people in, involved. Yeah, and you bring up an absolutely wonderful point, Annie, for those people who are not nurses, one of the most important things would be to do that, like pain assessment. Mm -hmm. So you're having pain, the nurses are giving you medication, is the medic medicine helping you? Mm -hmm. Is it not helping you? You know, those types of that, that PQRST. So when does it start? How long does it last? Where is it located? And reporting those things back to the directors of care, because the directors of care, I believe, are all nurses. Mm -hmm. 
um, or the majority of them are nurses, or they do have a nurse on site who would be able to um, help support that if they are working with a patient who is involved with the regional palliative consultation team and there are concerns about pain management, just loop us in. You know, we're identified in the CRIS file as a provider uh, through RPCT. And so just, just loop us into issues with pain management and, and we're happy to support for sure. Yeah, so it's not, you don't need to know uh, regular dosing. And I, I just point this out because if you do see orders for subcut and PO dosing, that's exactly the same, that's not safe. So it doesn't matter what the dose is necessarily, just if you see orders for both subcut slash PO together, that's not a safe order. But the most important thing would be to do that assessment and flag that somebody's struggling with their pain management and get the right people involved, either the director of care and the physician at the retirement home or the palliative team. If it's one of the physician uh, palliative teams or uh, RBCT supporting a family care provider. Anything else that came up in the chat? No, that's the only one, but I, I love, I have a question if I could. Yeah. Um. So I'd be interested in hearing just a little bit more about the dynamic. Like if, you know, there's home and community care, um, care coordinator, and then um, there's might be, there's service provider organization nurses, then there's nurses within the retirement home. And I imagine it works in, different ways, but could you say like what a typical approach might be for a patient who's getting opioids or medications for pain? Like who'd be doing the pain assessment? Who'd be administering the subcutaneous medications? How does that work in the context of a person being cared for in a retirement home? So from my experience, the medications for a patient who is coming near end of life um, and or not able to administer the medications, typically it's the retirement home nurses who are administering the medications to the patient and following up with the pain management. The visit nurses are coming in um, on a regular basis. So depending on where the patient is in the trajectory of their illness, they may be coming in monthly, weekly, every second week, daily twice a day, it really depends on uh, where they're at in terms of their disease. Um, the visit nurses don't administer the medications themselves, but in some, um, some places may do pre-draws for families, depending if the retirement home allows families. And I say all retirement homes have very different rules and regulations around who can administer what medications, where the medications are stored, and um, all of that. And then as patients get closer to end of life and they do have um, symptom response kit medications and they have shift nursing, which is also supplied through home and community care. Often in my experience, what happens is the shift nurse would sign out medications from the retirement home, have them in the room to administer overnight and sign them back in at the end of the night. In other cases, the, the shift nurse would have to call the nurse at the retirement home to have the medication brought at the time they need to administer it. So it really depends on the retirement home. It really depends on the patient and where they're at. But the majority of medications are being administered by the retirement home staff. Thanks, Kelly. I, I know we're getting, uh, we're actually a minute over our time, but does anybody else have any questions for Kelly? And I'll just go through just to get in touch if anybody needs anything. So Champlain Healthline, which you guys all know about my contact and then references and then more information if anybody needs it. And uh, Carl has also put um, a post-session survey link in the chat. So please let us know how what you thought of the session and what we could be doing more to support practice in retirement homes.